we are the American Library Association student chapter. And tonight we're, we were able to invite Kelly Williams and this was thanks to funding that we received from associated students at San Jose State University. So thank you to them for supporting us. So tonight's um, theme is library programming for community engagement. And we've invited Kelly Williams. Uh, she's the supervisory uh, librarian at Gwinnett County Public Library, and that's in Georgia. So thank you for joining us from all three time zones over there. Absolutely glad to be here. So I'm going to start us out with a poll. And this is just a little icebreaker so we can have a little fun here. And go ahead. I would write a young adult. I read far too many teen books. Well, and you said you do programming for different ages, so. Mm -hmm. I've got younger kids, I've got a teenager, I've got adults, I've got everybody. I've got a dog, I don't do programs for dogs actually, although I should. <laughs> Yeah. She's barking because okay. she's jelly. Uh, we have, oh, it's a mix. So I'm going to share the results of our poll. I just want to share with everyone that uh, we are recruiting for new uh, members to our executive board. Uh, these are the uh, different positions that are open now. Uh, if you would like inf more information on, that, on this, uh, please send me an email or you can send it to uh, the group's email. But we do have a lot of fun. Uh, there are definitely perks and you know it's great for networking. Not only do you get to meet uh, other students in the program, but you get to have a lot of interaction with the uh, iSchool faculty. And it's just a great experience and it has made me feel um, very much like I am part of a community, uh, and I am now in my second year uh, as events coordinator for uh, ALASC. Tonight, I want to introduce our speaker, Kelly Williams. She's a supervisory librarian at the Gwinnett County Public Library in Georgia. I first met Kelly in June virtually at the Library 2.0 conference on reinventing libraries for post-COVID world. I actually moderated her session, which was on getting the most out of your uh, virtual programs. I really enjoyed the presentation and I, I learned so much and I've actually been a, a, able to apply a lot of it to my role as events um, coordinator for ALASC. And for this reason, I was you know, I reached out to Kelly and I'm so glad that she has accepted our invitation to give this presentation tonight. So welcome Kelly, I'm so glad you're here. Thank you so much. And I will stop share and I will allow you to start yours. Thanks very much, Kelly. I'm really happy to be here. And honestly, I'm so happy that you were able to get something out of my program. Um, it was a lot of fun to do and I really enjoyed it. So virtual programming is not something that anybody expected when we went into library world or when we went into the pandemic. It was just something that I wouldn't say was forced upon us, but definitely was a surprise. So, but I mean, all's fair in love and war and all is fair in the world of programming. It's gonna be a surprise around every corner. And I'm here to help kind of introduce you, kind of slide you into the shallow end of the programming pool, as it were. Um, I'm gonna call this Programming 101. So what is a library program? I ask you today, um, if you wanna think about that for a couple minutes while we start going through this presentation. Um, here's a bit about what I'm going to be talking about today. What is a program? How do you decide what kind of programs you're going to do? How do you decide when, where, how, where do you get the ideas for it? Where do you get the budget for it? Who's going to show up to your programs? Things like that. 
Um, I've also been asked to cover a little bit about library associations and how I've gotten a lot out of them and to kind of coerce people into joining them. Um, and then I've got a little bit of a couple of fun extras for you at the end. So let's dive right in. So the IMLS, the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences, has a really broad strokes idea of what a program is. So it's a basically a planned event for any library. It can be educational, it can be creative, it can be fun, it can be outdoors, it can be indoors, it can be virtual, it could be in person, it could be a mixture of the both. Um, basically what you're trying to do with a library program is show the people in your community and who use your library what the library has to offer we're there to support them. We're there to bring them in and to bring our services out to them. So it's a great way to show off library services and resources, the skills of library people who work there, and honestly, so much more than that. Uh, there are what I would consider to be four main types of programs, although really the sky's the limit. Um, creative is one of my favorites crocheting, painting, drawing, uh, how to sew, how to do draw with chalk. There can be basically any kind of creativity that you can put into a program. You could do um, fan clubs, you could do wall art, you could create a mural outside of the library, anything like that. STEM is super close to my heart. That's science, technology, engineering, math. Um, used to be STEAM. We kind of took the arts out and made it its own category because it was so important. Um, learning labs are also a huge part of that. They can go by several different names, but that's a place in the library that has like 3D printer or it has um, Adobe Creative Suite or it has sewing machines. That's the kind of stuff that we have in our learning lab and you can do programs with that. Um, another great kind is what I like to call interactional. So this is where you go to the library or a library event and you're interacting with other people. So book clubs are not really about the book. They're about getting to know other people in the community who like similar things to you and or don't like it. And you can sit there and discuss it and get to know each other. Rent a human is also something that's similar. Um, it's something that we've just started here recently that we've had a great time with. That's where you can kind of sit down with somebody who is maybe from a different world than you are, who's going to have different thoughts and ideas. And you get to sit with them and hear about the way that they think about life and the way that they go around things. Um, so I just think that's really interesting. And I'm looking forward to sitting down for a session for something like that for myself. And then lastly is the one that people think of mostly when they think of library programs is education. So computer classes, we're teaching you to type, we're teaching you to use Word and Microsoft programs, we're teaching you how to find small business resources, we're teaching you how to use the library's resources, um, teaching language programs. What we do in my library is something really cool called Let's Talk. Um, and that's kind of interactional and education because what they're doing is they're helping people who, whose original language is not English to kind of learn this conversational English just by chatting with each other. So it's a great way to kind of teach and get to know each other better at the same time. Like I said before, there are many more kinds of programs than this. The sky is the limit and really the only limit is your own imagination for this. I do always like to point out the difference between passive programs and hands-on programs. So a passive program is you maybe leave flyers out in the library that have a scavenger hunt that kids can do and look around the library and find different things. Maybe it's a bingo card. They can walk around and check things off. Um, it's something that they can take out to their local parks and recreation and explore the area or explore different parks. Um, things that doesn't require staff time. Uh, except for, you know, printing out the flyers and coming up with the ideas and things like that. So it's kind of a hands-off program. And then on the opposite side of the spectrum is the hands-on program. So that's uh, anything that is devoted staff time to. It's usually scheduled on a calendar somewhere. So story times, these language classes, book clubs, origami, creative things, uh, fan art clubs, anything like that. So it's one-on-one -on -one or one librarian with a bunch of people or a bunch of kids, anything like that. 
So that's something that's going to be more dedicated and take more of your time. So as an example, here is a passive program. Um, I always like to share photos of programs that I've done myself. This one is for Chalktober. Um, some people also do Inktober where they're doing drawings and stuff. What we did is outside of our branch. So this branch was near, is near a middle school and a high school, close enough that the kids are walking there after school. They're waiting for their parents to pick them up or they're waiting for a younger sibling to get out of class and they're they need something to do you know they got to have some hands on to do so that's creative and fun so we put a mandala with uh tape on the outside of the wall we gave them chalk and we said color away go you know do do your thing get some creativity out have a good time so that's a passive program and then this is something that I really enjoyed. We did it for uh, Halloween. We had kind of a STEM night that was Halloween related so that the kids could wear their costumes. As you can see, I've got a little princess on the left and a little Iron Man, I think. Um, so this is a STEM program where we made Ooblek, which is a non-Newtonian fluid mixture of starch and water that is liquid when it doesn't have force applied to it and solid when you apply force to it. So I had grown adults coming in and punching the liquid and as soon as you hit it, it becomes a brick wall. So it was a lot of fun. Um, it was really hands-on. You can see in the left picture, that's me by the way, hi. Um, you can see in the left picture, we've got kids here and then we've also got teens on the right. That was from my teen advisory club, uh, the TAC who were volunteering their time, but they were also there having a great time. So um, library programs are just a great way to bring together all kinds of different age groups, show them something new, something that may, they may not have tried before, just to let them have a good time, just to learn, anything like that. So uh, if my lovely alter unit, Kelly with an I, um, would go ahead and set up the poll, please. I just want to, I just thought it'd be interesting to see if any of you have attended library programs. So like this could be as far back as did you attend story time when you were a baby? Have you come to a book club recently? Have you gone to a workshop where they taught you how to change a tire? Have you gone to an academic library program where they were teaching you how to use some of the resources and databases? I just think it's interesting to see because in libraries, a lot of people don't know that programs are things that we offer. I work in a public library and I get people who come in every single day and say, I haven't been here since I was a kid because I'm just not doing that much reading anymore. So, and libraries are all about books, right? Pause me, for laughter. Oh, sorry, Kelly, with a Y. It's yeah, Kelly with an I. Uh, <laughs> let me know when you want me to launch it. I have it already here lined up, so. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Awesome. So, and I like to bring up this poll when, or I'm sorry, this quote, when we're talking about library programs, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Um, it's been attributed to various people over all walks of life, over all sorts of times. Um, but it's something to think about when you're thinking about putting on a program for yourself. What do you enjoy? What do you think people would enjoy coming to? And if you love doing stuff like that, then it makes it so much easier to do your job. Honestly, it really does. So why do we do programming? There's a couple of different reasons. Um, we want to get in touch with our communities. First of all, we want to support them in the things that they need, whether that's growing their job skills, supporting family togetherness or families coming in and doing things together. We of course are gonna support learning. The books are great for that, resources, anything like that. But learning is not limited to just books. Um, I did an adulting and I know adulting, the word is kind of over now, it's time is done. Uh, but I did an adulting program for how to change a tire. And I had teenagers and adults come to that because it's just not a skill that you would pick up on the regular. So why not come to the library and learn it? Um, we're supporting people experiencing homelessness. Do we have resources for them? Do we have spaces for them? Small businesses as well. Um, we want to teach people. We want to promote literacy. We want to encourage creativity. We want to show all the good resources that we're spending our good money on. We want to teach people how to seek the truth and do research for themselves. 
uh, that's really important in this day and age as well, because, you know, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of untruths out there and we want to teach diversity. It seems like something that should just come naturally, but it's, it needs to be reinforced. It needs to be taught. So that's one of the goals of the library is to do that. And lastly, we want to inspire. We want to pe inspire people to create. We want to inspire people to come together. Maybe they come to a book club or to a rent a human thing and they're getting to meet their neighbors or they're getting to learn about somebody that they never knew about before. We want to inspire them to provide. So can they start a business? Can they sew something and make something for their kid? Can they, uh, anything like that really. And we also want to also inspire community. So not just families, not just friends, but come in and meet somebody new and learn something new, hopefully. So I'm ready for the poll results whenever you are, Kelly. Sure. Okay, here we go. Uh, are you able to see those, Kelly? I'm not, unfortunately. Okay. Do you mind Vanna I... Whiting it? And... <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, uh, public in-person, 69%. Uh, uh, public virtual, 31%. Uh, academic in-person, 38%. Academic virtual, 8%. Uh, K-12 to school in-person, over 50%. K-12 school virtual, 15%. And special libraries, um, uh, well, 8% and 8% virtual. Uh, and then, sorry about that. None of the above, uh, two people. So there we go. Okay. I. I'll, shall we go ahead? I think I, I'll stop sharing now and everyone has that. Okay. Kelly, I think that you're on mute. Gotcha. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Kelly with an Y. Okay. <laughs> so, <Yep>. oh. <laughs> no worries at all. Whoops. Ah. All right. Technical difficulties are to be expected. And honestly, if I hadn't had at least one slip up, then I would have been really concerned. So um, ready to move on, Kelly with an I? Yep. All right, awesome. Um, so I pulled these statistics from the 2019 IMLS survey of public, and this is public only. I know that there are boatloads of other programs and other uh, types of libraries, but public is the one that has the most numbers, I guess, the most easily accessible numbers, at least for me. Um, so 5.9 million public library programs in 2019. There's about 9,070-ish public libraries total in the states. So having that many programs is absolutely awesome. Um, a little bit more than half of them are children's programs. So, but that means that the other almost half a percent is teens and adults. So we're trying to draw people of all ages into the programs here. We want to teach kids how to read. Absolutely. We wanna provide books for teens. Absolutely. We want to uh, have a place where senior citizens can go and just sit and chat with each other. Absolutely. All of the above. Um, and then I just thought it was neat. Total attendance at library programs, 124.76 million. I had to do a double take when I looked at those numbers um, and I actually turned and teased my story time staff member at my library that about half of those were hers because she always gets a huge crowd at her story times. But I, I just think that's really neat. That's uh, I'm a library person, not a math person, so I can't do the quick math on that for you. Uh, but that is a great number of people at these programs. So, you know, the people who say, I thought libraries were just for books. <clears throat> they can talk to the 124 and a half million people who have been coming to the library for things besides that. 
more picture programs. Uh, this is a multicultural festival that we did at my library just here recently. Um, we had trifold displays of different countries that were represented by staff. So we had Nigeria, we had India, we had Mexico, we had Australia. Um, and we were able to promote the library's resources. So you can see our books, you can see some of the research that we have there. We also did a craft for kids. We had uh, language sharing for adults. There's a buku of things that you can put into just about every single program. So like one program doesn't have to be about one thing. And it's just, it's a great way to have some fun, get your community together and get to know everybody in it. Um, one of the great things actually, and I hate to leave a picture up for too long, but I just love it too much. I got to keep going. Um, one of the great things about this program was that we asked people to come in and say, hey, what do you call a library in your language? What do you call a book in the language that you speak? And through doing that, unintentionally, we were able to find that there are about two or three other languages that we didn't know about that were being spoken in our community. So you're putting on these programs and you're learning more about, you know, the topic. I accidentally learned an insane amount of stuff about Australia, um, but you're also learning more about their community and they're learning more about you at the same time. I just think that's really cool. All right. Quick deep breath for me because I am a chatter and I could go on all night. Um, I just want to stop here real quick and see if there are any questions. You can put them in the chat or you can unmute real quick and ask. Right. So what do you love to do that you could turn into a library program? Oh, that's a really good question. Hmm. Yep. That's it honestly. <laughs> I think it takes some thought, but yeah, I just, I love all the things that you were um, talking about, just things I wouldn't, the, what was it? Rent a human? That's so interesting. And I wonder where that idea came from. The terminology is a little weird. And I wish I could think of a better, better term for it. But honestly, I thought that was so funny. I just had to share it. Um, so let me see. Any questions, Kelly? Or am I okay to keep going? Um, well, Irene's asking, uh, how do you find people to be the person in the rent a human program? That is a great question. So I know that, at least for my library, and there are lots of other libraries that do this as well, um, but I can only speak personally to mine. We have a wide network of volunteers that we have for our programs. And some of them, uh, you know, they're just there to shelf books, but maybe they're interested in helping the library in other ways. Maybe they are the child of a family of immigrants and they can share their story. Maybe they're Maybe they lived abroad for 10 years while they went to school. You know, there's always something interesting about somebody that you can find. Um, I know that for the first couple of rounds, it was mostly volunteers and staff, which in and of itself should work pretty well if uh, most library staff are pretty diverse and always have a lot of stuff to share. Um, but a lot of our volunteers were very diverse as well. But once it got going through a couple of rounds, it really picked up steam and people started volunteering to come in. Um, do you have one second if I mute and step away real quick? Yes, please do. I understand. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, Jessica is saying uh, she's in a school library right now and have so many ideas I can't get to them all. Yeah. I totally understand that. Uh, Jessica, I'm just curious, was there a time uh, during the pandemic when your school library was closed and then you try what was what happened then uh, with you in the school library? If you are okay with unmuting yourself, it just Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Can you hear oh. me now? <laughs> yep. We can hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, we were closed for um, the entire school year last year up until the last, uh, we did about six weeks at the end of the year. 
which was interesting. <laughs> and I, um, I just turned our whole program virtual. I mean, I did virtual story time. So I created a YouTube channel so that I could do story time that way. And then um, we did arts programs virtually. And um, so I like tie it, created an art project related to a book and the kids could participate in that. And then um, I just did a lot of uh, resource. Um, I built up the website and did a lot of resources to sort of do, to talk to th about things that I might've presented to them if they had been in the library. So that's kind of where I focused. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Uh, Jessica mentions that she tried Observe the Moon Night, which sounds really cool. Uh, didn't have much of a turnout. Kelly, do you have a suggestion? What happens when you come up with a new program and how do you get people to actually participate? Do it again. <laughs> uh, a, an idea can be recycled pretty much endlessly. Observe the Moon Night is, a, is an annual event um, as far as I know. So you keep trying, maybe you do it at a different day, maybe you do it at a different time. Uh, maybe you walk around in the library and tap on people's shoulders, uh, not if they're wearing headphones, please don't do that. <laughs> and don't tell anybody I told you to do that. Uh, but walk around and tap on people's shoulders and say, hey, if you have a minute, we have a telescope out here. You wanna check out the moon real quick? Um, so it's just, you know, you gotta promote it in a different way or try again, anything like that. Great. Yeah, thank you. All right. I yeah, think absolutely. that was all that we had in chat. So very cool. I'm going to chug right along. All right. So um, the question stands. And if you think of anything else along the way, please feel free to go ahead and put it in the chat. What do you love to do that you could turn into a library program? And I will hopefully give you a couple ideas here along the way. And a great thing about this is even if you think that it might not work, go ahead and put it because somebody else could have a great idea about how to turn that into a great program and share it with you. I think Jessica just had a, a, another uh, comment here. She said, I'd like to develop a young naturalist program partnering uh, with our local land conservancy. Is there any advice for partnering, uh, partnering with organizations? Lots. Um, make the expectations clear way ahead of time. Um, that's usually not as big a deal with maybe like parks and rec departments or nonprofits or things that are on a similar wavelength to your library, but especially with like businesses and things like that, anything outside of the library, you want to make it absolutely clear to them. They are not there to promote their business. They're there to do this thing. Um, you want to give really clear expectations like, okay, you'll talk for 10 minutes and then we'll do this thing. And then you'll talk for 10 minutes again. Um, nail down the times and dates and things like that. As clear as you can possibly make it is going to make it easier on you and on them. So partnerships and outreach and things like that are a great resource for uh, programs. That's awesome. Thank you. Very cool. So what are we talking about when we talk about things that you're into? Um, ideas and interests and places where you can get your ideas from. So hobbies is a great one to start. Um, do you do macrame? Do you do woodworking? Do you uh, change tires on your car and maintain it yourself? What are the things that you are good at that you could bring to other people at the library? That's a great resource, especially if you have like fandoms that you're into or maybe you mo do movies, maybe you do karaoke, something like that. If you're into it, somebody else is into it too. And that's a great place to mine ideas. Um, thoughts and things that are going on kind of in your head are a great thing to turn into a program. Um, recently, you know, everybody's been talking about the trials. So maybe you should have a conversation about diversity and police reform. Maybe you can do that with your library. Be careful. Um, what's going on, you know, in the world that you can talk about. Social media is a huge resource, um, especially since TikTok became popular. I know uh, book talk is a huge thing. So turn book talk into a book club, 
turn the latest dance craze into a dance class. Something that is going on on social media is going to interest a wide variety of people and it's going to be something cool that you can bring into your library. And then the last one is help yourself. What would you have enjoyed when you were younger? I, what would you have, what would have helped you? <laughs> what would have helped you in your life? Anything like that. So I mentioned adulting earlier and how to change a tire. I brought that program, um, how to change a tire, how to balance a checkbook, how to file your taxes. Um, it's something that if you're thinking about it and you need help with it, chances are that somebody else is going to need help with it too. So it's a great thing to think about when you're planning programs. Here are a fair amount of resources that you can look into. Um, online is one that I've talked about a lot, social media and things like that, but don't discount print. There are books and professional resources that have tons of program ideas, um, programs that have been done before, like the Observe the Moon Night. Just because you did it once doesn't mean you can't do it again. We do multicultural night every year. Um, other libraries, that was one of the reasons I asked the poll about whether or not you've attended library programs, because if you get a chance to visit other libraries, you can see kind of what they're doing. Maybe you don't have to attend the program. Maybe you can just pick up their newsletter and see what kind of cool things they've got going on and kind of, you know, retool them and make them your own. Local is a great resource. Um, we've had several author events because people have come in and said, hey, there's this great local author in Gwinnett, and we've got one or two of their books. Why don't we have them come in and do a book signing? What your customers are asking for is things that they're interested in, that they're looking for out of their library. And if at all possible, it's great to help out with that. And then experience is really cool. Attend a library program so you can see what's being done right now. Um, I highly recommend that whether or not you're going for idea mining, because you can see how does the printer, presenter interact with the audience? How are the chairs set up? What kind of age groups are attending? How long does it last? Are people doing talking the whole time? Are they doing crafts? Are they doing hands-on stuff? And that can set the stage for how you want to run your own programs. So I just think that's really neat. Um, a few of my favorite places to find ideas. Um, I just recently joined the ALA Think Tank on Facebook. It is a fantastic group. It is very active, loads of ideas in the comments. It's been really great. Um, similarly, Programming Librarian, it's got groups on Facebook and it's a blog and a website dedicated to programs. Um, <clears throat> I love getting programming newsletters because they come straight to my inbox, don't have to go hunting for them, and then I have it right there available whenever I need an idea. Pop it into a folder, forget about it until you need something new. Um, Girls Who Code is one of my absolute favorite programs that I've done before. They give you step by step. You don't know how to, you don't have to know how to code to begin with. They give you all of the tools and instructions and materials and the girls, it's open to all ages, but it's intended uh, specifically for girls because that's an underrepresented area in IT and technology. Um, <clears throat> And it gives them all the instructions to go through and create their own website, app, or project. So they're spending this time getting to know other girls who are interested in this kind of stuff, building a project from scratch, and learning how to code along the way. It's just all in all a great thing. Um, and then Crazy It's Bedtime Map is so much fun. It is so much fun. They have different age groups, so like 5 to 8. 8 to 12, so you're not getting like the really young kids and the older kids all working together on the same stuff. Um, you don't have to purchase anything. It's funded through a couple of grants, I believe. So, And they just sh ship you all of the materials straight to your library. All of the instructions are available online. Um, some of the projects involve counting money, doing division, doing multiplication, figuring out where things fit spatially. So putting glow sticks together to build a structure. And it's, you know, it's all math related and I learned some stuff along the way. So highly recommend that. Um, it is for youngish kids. So be prepared and definitely limit registration on that. That's a huge deal. <laughs> all right, so where do I go from here? How do I plan a program? I've got this like cool idea. How do I implement it? It is harder and easier than you might think. So you start with your idea 
and super important to focus early on. How can it be made diverse and inclusive? How are you going to include elements to make sure that it's open to everybody? How are you going to include elements to make sure that it is showcasing all of the great things about our community and not just focusing on one viewpoint? Um, how can it fit and help the community? Is it teaching kids math? What's the objective? How is it going to work? What's it going to teach them? Where and when will it be? So observe the, I hate to keep pick, picking on whoever brought up this program, but the observe the moon night. It's a holiday, basically. It's set for that one night, but what time is it gonna be? Is it gonna be after the library closes? Is it gonna be out in the parking lot? Is it gonna be at a local park? Anything like that. And then unfortunately, one of the considerations that we have to consider is how much will it cost? Um, a lot of great programs can be done for free or for super cheap. Um, there is a Google Cardboard program that is cost maybe $20 for about 30 or 40 kids. You're just using cardboard and cutting it up and buying lenses. And then the kids get to leave with their own virtual reality glasses. It's just about the coolest thing that I've ever done. So these are all things that you need to think about when you're developing your program. Here are, and I know that's a lot, <laughs> uh, some useful skills that you need to have that you don't need to have when you're beginning, but they're useful to have when you're putting together programs. So you've got your logistical stuff and you've got your creative stuff. You've got your planning, your budgeting, your implementing, your making partnerships, calling and talking to people on the phone, coordinating who's going to show up when. Uh, deciding what kind of age groups you're going to do, deciding how many people you want to limit your participation to, uh, what, who, how, where, you know, that kind of stuff is going to be super important when it comes to planning your program. It's not the end of the world if you don't know how to do it, but always ask for help. And then creative is great. That I tend to skew towards more the logistical side and working out the details of it than the creative. So one of the great things that I do is personalizing. So you're taking an idea that you found somewhere else, tweaking it to make it your own, fit your library, your skill set, anything like that. So maybe you can cook, but you can only bake bread. So you can do a program on that. Maybe you don't have the space to show everybody how to bake their own bread. So take it virtual. Um, idea gathering is also a creative aspect of it. You know, where are you getting these ideas from? Where are, and how are you going to make them work for you? So, um, again, no need to have these skills going into it, but these are useful to have. So, programming competencies are things that you need to know in order to put on a great program. Don't have to be good at it. You just have to be willing to try organizational skills, what people in the community want, uh, knowledge about the content. So if you're going to present uh, about programming for 30 minutes, you should have a background in programming. I've been doing it for, Lord Almighty, six or seven years. Uh, financial skills are always good. Are you going to go to the dollar store? Are you going to go to Walmart? Where are you going to go? Um, outreach and marketing. Some branches, I'm sorry, some libraries have a specific department just for that. But if you know how to use Canva or Google Drawings to make your own posters, that's going to save you a huge amount of time and effort. And then event planning is kind of the be all end all of this. Who, what, where, when, how is your program going to be? That's a lot, a lot of information. Uh, and I hope that if you have any questions, you put it in the chat and we'll answer them in just a couple of minutes. Um, but real quick, Kelly wanted me to speak briefly about the benefits and the perks of joining your local American Library Association. Uh, I put the hyphen S right there, the apostrophe S, because associations, there are so many. Just about every state has one. Um, I'm a member of the Georgia Library Association and the American Library Association. There's all kinds of divisions, interest groups, uh, anything like that that you can join. Um, if you're already a member of your local one or the national one, um, go ahead and drop it in the chat. We can chat about that in a minute. Uh, WIFM is what's in it for me. So why are you joining this thing? Um, why are you paying whatever the annual membership cost is? Well, you're going to be in touch with the library community at whole. 
Um, just from the Georgia Library Association, there's so many different libraries in Georgia. It's honestly ridiculous. So we're getting to see what they're doing. So maybe you can get ideas for your own branch or you can chat it up to them about a cool new program that you're doing and share it out there. Somebody else can take that program or idea and roll with it on their own, you know? So uh, information sharing is a huge one. Um, access to webinars and training. The Georgia one specifically has the Carteret webinar series, which is awesome. Um, continuing education hours is super important, especially if you're planning on getting your library license. Um, networking events is huge. So the annual ALA conference is great. Midwinter is great. Um, they're doing a new thing coming up soon, the LibLearnX event. So that's going to be virtual as well. You're getting to know people who also work in the library field and they're going to have something to offer you and you're going to have something to offer them. Um, and interest groups are one of my absolute favorites. My local organization didn't have a programming interest group, so I started one. Um, if you find something that is interesting to you that maybe hasn't been started yet, I guarantee you there's somebody else who's going to be interested in it. Um, these are a great place to share your ideas, get ideas from other people. So uh, programming, intellectual freedom, uh, training and resources, databases, online languages, anything like that. There's something for everybody. Why get involved? This is sort of a variation of WIFM, but um, a lot of, especially in academic libraries, a lot of tenure positions require leadership or involvement in your local association. So that's a great way to do it. Um, I've met some of my close friends who are only there because of the tenure and then stayed because they enjoyed it so much. Um, it always looks good on the resume. So I can put started my own interest group on my resume and that looks super cool. Um, networking, I've spoken a little bit about it before, but it's huge. You're going to, over time, you attend these events and you figure out people's names and you know who they are. So if you're stuck on something, you can give people a call and say, hey, what would you do with this? Or if somebody has a cool project that's going on, like a strategic planning process or anything like that, maybe they think of you and give you a call. So that's always a good thing to do. And giving back to the profession is a huge thing. Our uh, new members roundtable is a great resource for new members. I'm still kind of newish myself. So um, all the people that have helped me along the way have helped me help you. So you're giving back and helping others get into the same position that you are or where you want to be. So last little bit of extras because I am completely out of breath. I don't know about y'all, um, <laughs> but some of the organizations that I've mentioned before, Crazy Eights, um, We Need Diverse Books, uh, not as much for programming, but it's a great organization and definitely a good resource. Um, programming Librarian, these are all linked. So um, Kelly has the slides and hopefully she'll be able to share it with you later. Um, Plix is fantastic, Exploratorium, Teen Services Underground, and then this idea book is great. So I kind of want to leave you with just one last final bit. Um, if you enjoy your work, you can help others to do the same. So I love programming, so I'm here today talking to y'all. Um, but if people don't know what you're working on, then they can't help you with it. So don't forget to share all the th cool things that you're working on and what you love doing so that, you know, it's out there. And that's it for me. Uh, I'm kind of a, a meme person, so I thought this would be fun to share. Uh, I am something of a scientist myself, as it turns out. Um, I have my email and my office number here. If you are interested, I would love to hear from absolutely anybody. If you have a question, a complaint, a uh, program idea that you want to float past me, anything like that. My library's website and our uh, information and everything like that. So cool. That's it for me. Oh, thank you so much. I love that presentation. <laughs> There's so much information. Um, it's probably yeah. too much. It's inspiring. It is. <laughs> it was inspiring for me when I, uh, in June, uh, when I moderated that session of yours. And yeah, it's really helped me think about how we do our event planning here at, uh, with the ALA student chapter. I'm glad. That's super cool. Yeah. Um, 
anybody else have any like questions or anything that came up in the chat that I can help with? Program ideas you want to float? We have a lot of big things. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's honestly, it's been a joy speaking to y'all. I don't know if you could tell, but I could go on about programming basically all day. So uh, trying to limit it so that y'all can get out of here and eat your dinners is something I was try <laughs> trying to work on. Oh, an Oreo taste test. <laughs> what was the best flavor? Uh, I can't eat them. I don't know, but um, <laughs> they, they had 12 different kinds and one of the librarians had been collecting them all year because they have some flavors that are only seasonal. So he had been preparing this for months and had 12 different tables and you could go taste each one and guess. And then it, and it was a really fun teen activity. Um, had pretty That's good fantastic. I know that um, being boozled that like jelly bean flavor guessing game has been super popular with my teens a couple of times. I don't know if I would do it for Oreos. Have you tried the Thanksgiving turkey candy corn? Mm. It's just, just the worst. It does taste like turkey though. <laughs> Yuck. <laughs> that might make it worse. That might actually be worse. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to put people off of buying it so that they don't put it out anymore. Mm -hmm. so Jessica no says, I feel a lot more confident going forward. Yeah. Oh, that's I, awesome. Yeah. That's the goal. Absolutely. You met it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Fake until you make it a great program. <laughs> that's right. Thank you so very much for your generosity in sharing your time with us. I know it's late where you are in Georgia, uh, but we do so appreciate it. Uh, everyone, you can always uh, get in touch with me with any questions. I will uh, email all of you in the next couple of days to let you know when the recording is available and uh, sharing the slides. Uh, there is just so much information. And as Kelly said, she's really open to anyone getting in touch with her, which, yeah, never be Super afraid to say hello. Um, Do not be afraid. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, good night, everybody. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Thanks so much, Kelly. You've made this super easy. <laughs>